Have you ever thought that every single choice you make affects your life now and in the future? My name is Jared Kite, and I'm a five element acupuncture master and psychotherapist. Over the past 35 years, I've worked with thousands of people coming for help with everything you could ever imagine. What fascinates me the most is what seems to be a distinct lack of awareness around the choices we make and the implications of those choices, for better or for worse. In this podcast series, we're examining the power of choice, that by consciously choosing how we think, how we feel, the actions we take, all shape our lives and our future. So if you're ready for some hard-hitting, heartbreaking interviews with people about their choices, join me here on The Power of Choice. Welcome to this fourth episode of The Power of Choice. And in this series, we are looking into fertility and baby making. We've looked at egg donation, sperm donation, adoption, all the different ways that people can start families. But what we do need to look at is the situation and the environment around people's choice to terminate a pregnancy or have an abortion. This is obviously a very sensitive area. And as I found out um, while trying to find people to interview for this episode, it seems that there is what I'm calling a code of silence around it. Just to look at some facts, um, just doing a bit of research about abortion. So technically, it is a medical procedure that ends a pregnancy. One in four pregnancies globally end in abortion. That's a number I, I never imagined would be so high. That Amnesty International are seeking for access for safe and legal abortion anywhere in the world. But of course, this is not readily available for many people around the world. And in the world, there are around 25 million unsafe abortions a year. So this is clearly still a huge um, issue for us as human beings um, around the world. And as we've seen recently in the United States, where Roe versus Wade was overturned and uh, abortion has become much more problematic, illegal in different parts of, of the, the U.S., so my work um, has been primarily around helping people make babies. So I wrote a book about it called The Art of Baby Making. So it's all about the uh, the promise of the future, of bringing new life into the world. And then here we are at the end of this series looking at the end of the beginning and, and a choice that people make and the very important thing that, that women have the right to choose. So um, my first guest is called Millie. And she came to me 10 years ago, and she came for general health at the time. A lot of my patients come because they just don't feel right or they feel stressed. And I remember we did talk about her personal and medical history, and we just touched on very lightly that she'd had um, two terminations. And I don't remember delving in that much more deeply at that time, as I often get the sense that this is an area that people don't necessarily want to talk about in detail um, and I certainly don't remember the story that we're now about to hear thanks to Millie joining me here on The Power of Choice. Good afternoon Millie. Good afternoon. And thank you so much for joining me here on The Power of Choice. Um, in recent weeks I've been talking to men and women about their choices around starting families and this series really wouldn't be balanced unless we look at the other side, which is, of course, a woman's right to choose to end a pregnancy. And I understand, you know, that you're, well, you're kindly going to chat with me about that today. Can I just ask, to ask you just a very broad question? What are your feelings around, around that phrase, the, the woman's right to choose? I think it's very important. You don't have to just look at America to think that they are basically really quite, uh, I find it bizarre, that they disallow, or certain states do, the right to a termination. I mean, you know, after being raped, my God, there are many laws that I find ridiculously out of date. I think the right to choose 
it seems to be lost, that word, I think, in a sense of if you think that a woman is not thinking about what she is deciding to do, that is her baby, and she knows it. I certainly did. I was just thinking that it might, it might be really helpful to hear the first time that you chose to end a pregnancy and what was happening there. But the first pregnancy, I am not sure, because I was quite young, I'm not sure whether I was with somebody, whether it was a, it was a mistake or whether I was with somebody, whether it was a long-term relationship. I really, I can remember going for it having to have the termination on my own and the pain. I was very young and I think at that there are moments at of course at certain ages that you think, well, this is a mistake. I haven't you know, you might have just been going out with this person for a relatively short time. You may think he's the love of your life. How old were you, Millie? I was quite young. I mean, I think I might have been younger than 20. And you were in a relationship with someone? Well, yes. I was in a relationship which actually was my first love. I've been trying to think about this. I can almost say, without a doubt, after that, who and why. But that first one, for some reason, is eluding me. Because you blocked it out, do you think? I don't know. I don't think so. I remember going to the place on my own. I don't know if I drove there myself. I probably, I might have. I remember the place. I remember the pain. And I remember being unhappy. It's not something that you would ever take on. It, it threw me. So it was the first time. It definitely threw me. You know, obviously the pain doesn't. It is a, an awful it hurts, you know, it hurts. It hurts mentally, it hurts, but it definitely hurts physically, and physically means that it hurts mentally. Was this a choice that you made on your own or with your partner? Was there a part of you that wanted to continue with the pregnancy? No, I don't think so. I think I definitely thought I was too young. It was definitely, you know, thing about what has been the case, certainly for me, and I'm not saying it's the case for everyone, at all. What has been the case for me is the question of the future. And the future has always been about the child. Not about me, not about him. Well, I mean, obviously, we are there as parents, but the future has definitely, my whole opinion has always been about what am I doing? Am I doing the right thing for the child? Okay, so that, that first time was not the right time for you to bring a child into the world. I think I also probably thought, you know, because unless you, until, for the first time, the first time that you have it, the first time you think about it or it happens, is you're never going to. Who could possibly tell you what it's like? Is anybody going to tell you? I mean, I, you know, I've heard from some women talking about how they've given birth. I've seen friends of mine who post giving birth. They go, oh, it's so wonderful, it was beautiful. And then their husband comes and says, you were screaming quite a lot. But nobody talks about this. Nobody talks about what it's like to have a termination. At the time, did you speak to friends that, or tell friends that you were going to do this or ask for their support? I don't think I've ever been particularly quiet about it. Did I know anybody who'd had one? I don't think I did, probably. I didn't grow up with lots of girls, that's the thing. I grew up with guys. So I don't think so. Very possibly not. When you talk about the pain... Yes, it's incredibly painful. Painful mentally and painful actually physically. Okay. That's what I wondered. I, I mean, obviously, this is something that people don't talk about that much. And I haven't really heard many people or they haven't, they haven't wanted to divulge their experience to me. So can you just, for the sake of people listening, help us understand when you say pain, emotional pain, 
what is that exactly? The emotional pain is your self-questioning. What could have been? Did I do the right thing? And you are very much on your own with that. Because to anybody else, including the person that you created this child with, you really, men are not keen to talk about it at all. Once you've done it, that's it. They don't want to talk about it. And so you are alone, definitely. That is something that will, you know what? There are so many things in your life that you will find that that will be the case. You're alone when your sister dies. You're alone when your parents die. And it is a death. Yes. Would you say the loneliness for you was the hardest part of that? Yes. It is something that will never leave you, ever. It is because you have so little time to think about it as well. And I can understand that for many people, it makes it a lot, well, not a lot easier, it doesn't make it easier, but it makes it a bit easier. The fact that somebody, a doctor will come by, generally a man, and say, well, you know, it's like the size of a peanut right now. Well, okay, fine. But in my experience, at a later date, when a South African doctor, S, and she have to, I don't know, anyway, doctor, she was a woman, who had no idea that I was going to have termination, she put this little, you know, thing of as you do over your belly. And, I mean, I was just not, I mean, I didn't have a belly at all. I mean, there was nothing there. And she went, and there's this little heartbeat. Great. Wow. And at which point I said, I'm having a termination. And so she looked at me and like, oh, oh, I'm sorry. But also with, you know, with, with, Regard, I mean, not sort of like disregard, you know, it's a sort of she had an opinion about it. And, yeah. and of course, everyone's entitled to their opinion. Was this the second termination? I have to say it's probably the second or the third, to tell you the truth. Here I am, age 50 plus, and with no children. Now, am I happy about that? No. And have I regretted my decisions at times? Yes. But the reasons and the timings people have asked me in the street you know and they ask me when i'm walking the dog oh well but it, you know, it doesn't happen a lot but sometimes people say how come you haven't had any children well yeah just wasn't the right time it wasn't it was with the best person i remember thinking i really didn't want to bring a child into this world at this point and that's just one of the aspects of it. The other aspects of, you know, the fact that you're going out with an arsehole or, why you know, well, and thankfully, not thankfully, because, my God, you shouldn't have to go through a termination just to get rid of a bloody stupid boyfriend. Did you at any point override that feeling of, I don't want to bring a child into the world in this situation? I mean, was, was there a conflict for you or was it always really clear? That was not really clear. And in fact, that was, uh, I think, I don't want to bring child into this world was only, was only happened once. It was probably subconsciously in the back of my mind for, and probably still is, actually. I have my moments where I sort of, I don't, unfortunately, my parents don't have any grandchildren. And I try and make light of it because I know my parents would have absolutely adored it. So I've denied them. I've denied them a life. I've denied a child a life. It's not out of selfish reasons. I out of selfish reasons of the, the, the fact of, oh, I can't be bothered, or it's not that. My God, I you know I'm a godmother to ten godchildren. I'm a pagan. I have absolutely no religious beliefs at all. But that, that doesn't, has made a, no, no difference about, but. I love children. I love, I know, yeah, I would have loved to. So that feeling of regret that you might have now at times, or you say you you do, do you think back and wish you'd made a different choice? And, And at which point was that? I was an idiot going out with the wrong people, always. 
And I remember the one person who I think I really was in love with. Well, I was, I, I've been very lucky. I've been in love with at least three people. But this was a person who I, everyone knew, all my friends knew that he was a great guy. Even with him, my, you know what my, my fear was? If I have a child with him, if this does not go well, if the marriage doesn't go well, it will kill him because he could not live without his child. And the way the world is at the moment, it, it, it leans towards a woman. It would be horrible. And I would never want to fight with him. You know, I loved him. But you were trying to protect him at that point rather than look after yourself. No, I don't think I was trying to protect him, although I, I, was, I was concerned about him. I wasn't trying to protect him. I was concerned about, still, about the child. Did he know you were pregnant? Yes. And I assume that the, the two of you sat and talked about what to do. Yes. I mean, I, I think I was probably more persuasive. And I suppose that is something that um, because you are, you are the vessel, for want of a better word. Can I just ask, so just so I'm clear about your situation at that time. So you were with this man who you were in love with and he wanted to be with you. Yes. And you were pregnant. So why, why didn't you guys go ahead? Because our life kept on changing. In what way? And I didn't feel that he, it became fairly obvious to both of us, not just to me, that we were, however much I loved him, and I did, and him, me too, that really we were very different people. Was it that you didn't trust that he would be committed to you as, as a partner, as, as a parent? No, no, it wasn't that. It was that I, I didn't trust myself to be the right person for him, that I thought that he was going to be incredibly unhappy because he was, to a certain extent, already unhappy. He didn't like our life, the life that I would like to live. Is it fair to say that a lot of these, these, these decisions to end pregnancies were more based on you not trusting that you could parent properly or find the right person to do it with. I think that probably is very fair. If I'm thinking about my relationships, they were much more complex than that. To me, it wasn't just about the fact that I didn't trust them to be the perfect human being. But did you at any point think, I can do this on my own, I can be a single mum and I'll, I'll make it work? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And that wasn't a persuading factor? No, not enough. I knew I could never do that. I think probably one of the other, even with, I mean, the final one that I had was with such a dickhead. I don't know why on earth I was thinking going out with him. How old were you then? Late. About 36, I think. So, I mean, maybe even older, but I think about, yeah, I think it was about 20 years ago. And, uh, you know, at that point, you know. You're like, well, <sighs> but before then, yes, I had thought about, could I do this on my own? The problem about that was because I knew how much and how wonderful my boyfriend was, that he would never let it just be me. No way. So there was a, and that meant, so maybe that is selfish, actually. You're making me think about that. Maybe that is selfish, but as I'm sitting there thinking, so I stopped having a child because I was too scared about co-parenting. I mean, my God, I never thought about it like that. It's a ridiculous thing. I mean, I, I hope people are way more sensible than I am. It's a huge thing to take on that role of being a parent. And I think, I'm guessing, I'm, I'm not a parent, so I can't say, but I'm guessing you have to really trust that you can do it because this is not for a year or five years. This is for life. It's for the rest of your life. And of course, yeah. but then, and, and of course, but I've seen my friends who have had children and that wonderful thing where they, you know, they've lost. There's also, it's hard. And I've seen equally, I've seen the problems that go with it. Life isn't easy, but if you have a good spirit and a good heart, 
My God, you can move mountains. Can I just ask about the actual time around the terminations? Did it feel any easier each time or more difficult? No, it's never felt easy. Never. So the first one, obviously I had no idea about how it would feel. And I was young. And I know, I thought, well, this is wrong. It's too early. This is not going to stop my life, as in I'm not going to not be able to get pregnant again. But you live with it and I can even... I don't know what's the word for it, really. So I'm not making jokes about it, but I can even sort of ratify it, I suppose. Is that the right word? Well, make, it, fact, make it acceptable. Make it acceptable. And the guy that I brought back from America, he was, anyway, whatever, he was an arsehole. And, I mean, there's a big story there. I was encouraging him to get back to speak to his parents and... He wasn't picking up the telephone for me, even though I brought him back from New York and I realised I was pregnant. And so I went to go and have this termination and he actually called me, called the hospital and said, how could you? I don't know. I was like, here, get away. And I just want people to understand that they are have every right to literally feel, talk, move to, I mean, I can't believe it. So here we are talking about the menopause these, these days and mental health, and yet nobody is talking about this. And that is shameful. Yes, that's what I've seen. Can I ask you, because this is, this, I think this is really important. Had you felt better able to communicate with these, the two men in the, in, in, the, in the last two cases, had you been able to really explain how you were feeling here, they were feeling? Do you think that might have changed your decision? In all seriousness, no. I just made bad choices. I seem to have always made bad choices. And my mother would be in heaven about the fact that I'm actually saying that. But you're saying bad choices in partners? Yes. And yet, okay. that's not true. I have. We all have, I think. I don't think everyone's perfect. I know I've made at least two great choices, but doesn't mean to say I've made all of them were great. They weren't. Millie, do you think it's possible for you to find some peace with the past and the choices that you made around terminations? Yes, I think I have, because it's done. You know, it's it's. I'm old. I speak about it. I actually speak about it quite openly. Understandably, there's a, a, a great deal of sadness around this, which is okay, isn't it? There are things in life that are sad. How much does that sit with you? It is a past, and it is something that... So it's history, and I've got, I've got future. You know, whether that's going to be any better is... Another thing, but we just get on. I mean, it doesn't mean that I don't think about it. I do, but I don't think about it so much. As you earlier said, people don't talk about this. And I was quite surprised yes. when I started asking around to see if there were people to talk to. And it was very striking to me how uncomfortable and understandable, but how uncomfortable this is for a lot of people. What do you think could change this? Because I, I, I heard you earlier when you said that we don't talk about this. We talk about mental health, menopause, etc. But what do you think would have helped you, for example, back then when you were 20? Just, I think that just generally that it was in, in, in a conversation. And this is just, and I, and I don't know why it isn't. Is it because we are some sort of semi-afflicted religious group of people who find it ghastly? I don't know. I mean, it's just sort of, why on earth do you not have somebody to go to? And I certainly wasn't going to church to go and speak to a priest about whether I was going to go and do it. But so there must be something. And why aren't women talking about it? They are talking about the menopause. They're talking about mental... We are talking about mental health. How could that not affect mental health? We talk about addiction, for God's sake. 
we're obviously we're having a conversation right now and i'm very aware as a man that i've got to be incredibly sensitive and humble in how i approach this because this is something i can never imagine okay that is because you are you you are such a kind and humble person but the fact is thank god sorry thank yahweh thank whoever you are doing this because it is very important. And I think you have obviously understood that this is something that does need to be addressed. And I am totally behind that because it's people should not feel, I mean, what else do we need to be ashamed about? What I would really like to take out of this for other women is yes the timeline that is unbelievably difficult because you're given six weeks at the most really to come up with a decision as to what to do and in those six weeks well probably three weeks gone by or at least four so you've now really got two weeks to work out what the hell you're going to do that isn't fair I just think that there needs to be a much broader conversation about this. So, Millie, thank you so much for being so open with me today. It's a very difficult area, I know, for anyone to talk about. So thank you for your courage to share with people listening. I'm sure it will, will definitely help a lot of people. I hope it does. I mean, this is there is nothing flippant about what I've said because it does count I think it's brilliant that you are bringing this to the floor because it needs it needs to be discussed right. well thank you so much for being part of this pleasure my second guest is Zara and Zara is in her mid 80s and currently lives in California and still working in healthcare um, with men and women it was really great to get her perspective um, seeing as she had a termination just as Roe versus Wade was um, seen through and abortion was legalized. This is back in 1973. So fascinating, but also sad story around what happened for her. Good morning, Zara. Good morning, Jared. Thank you so much for joining me this morning. I'm going to jump straight in to um, many years ago. And you told me that in 1973, it's a long time ago, you had an abortion. Correct. Can you just, just tell me a little bit about the situation that you were in and, and what was happening at that time? Well, I think for most of my... Well, when I was younger, I assumed I was going to have children. Then I began to have concerns. And I remember thinking, I don't want to do to a child what was done to me, but I couldn't be specific about what was done to me. I just knew I had this hesitation. And then when I moved to California... And I started watching my friends bringing up their children, and I got a new sense of how one could raise children, which was more about finding out who they were <laughs> as opposed to imposing, which was done on me, about who I should be. And so I became more open to it, but I was still ambivalent. And so in my early 30s, I was talking with a friend who had six children, and I said, you know, I don't know if I want a child or not. And I had an IUD in, so, you know, I, had, I was always using birth control. And she said, well, you know, get pregnant. Then you'll find out if you want it, have it or not. And she said, and if you don't, you have an abortion. I've had six abortions. Like it was nothing. Wow. Anyway, and I believed her. Yeah. So I had the IUD taken out. And this was in the early 70s, yeah? This was in the early 70s. And I was in a new relationship. That was wonderful, but it was with somebody who was quite a bit younger than I. And anyway, he I had the IUD taken out. I said to I said to my doctor, I wanted to be in my own hands, and he, you know, what you know what happens? And he took the IUD out and put it in my hand and said, Okay, it's in your own hands. And <laughs> wow. you know, off I went. Four months later, I was pregnant. And did you actually hope you would conceive at that point? I didn't know. As I say, I mean, the title of this whole thing could be ambivalent. 
I mean, it was just, I did not know. Right. And my partner was very excited when he found out I was pregnant. My friends were mm -hmm. excited. Every, And I was terrified. How old were you then? I was 33. Okay. And was there any question about conceiving outside of marriage at that time? Absolutely. Now, I had friends who had conceived outside of marriage. You know, I was in California, and it was no big deal. But I was now in New York, and I was near my family. And I knew that because I hadn't gotten married and I had been living with various partners, it, it felt to me like, you know, they were just waiting for this shoe to drop. And it could have been my projection, but anyway, that was... So I decided, okay, I have to tell them and see what the reaction is. Your parents, yeah? My parents. And the first person I went to was my father, who at the time was between his third and fourth marriage. You know, I said, I'm, I'm pregnant. And first I told him to have a drink. And uh, then I said, you know, I'm pregnant. <laughs> and uh, he kind of said, well, even cows can do that. You know, like, so what? Wow. Wonderful. Yeah. But then we got into it a bit. That was his denial anyway. And he was like, you know, well, why don't you marry him? And I just looked at him and I said, you're asking me why I don't marry him? He said, well, at least I try. You're too chicken shit to even try. So, I mean, it was all very lighthearted in a way and horrible in another way. Anyway, I left with nothing resolved. Would you say that was was typical of the kind of new mindset around that time? Or was that unusual? That kind of rather casual casual approach to abortion and... His thing, oh, his thing was his best friend's niece who had to be... Anyway, his best friend was caretaker for his niece. And she was part Tahitian. And she had gone to live in Italy and she had gotten pregnant with a married man. And she had kept the baby and gone back and lived in, in Tahiti. And my father say, says, well, it's okay for her, but people know you. And I was like, no, we're talking about people know you. You know, anyway, it was concern about image. Yeah. So anyway, that was that. And then I went <laughs> and talked to my mother. And this is just so incredible. Anyway, I told her she threw up and took a, a Valium. And then we had a long, very emotional conversation. I learned that she had had, well, it was called a D and C between my sister, my older sister and me. Oh, because it was too soon. But anyway, you know, these wealthy women were able to get rid of children if they, you know, have, have them if they wanted to long ago. Anyway, so she had had that and she was very upset. Anyway, I finally left. And as I was in the car driving away, she said to me, if you want to have a child, have an abortion and adopt one. That way there'll be no stigma. Wow. I'm guessing this was more evidence of how you started this when you said that you didn't want to repeat the same pattern. Is that fair to say you had that, that, that kind of reaffirmed? Yeah, I was just like, I mean, it was, I mean, I can remember as I was growing up so often things would be said to me and I'd go, where is that written? It just didn't make any sense to me. But they were just in this, how they had been raised, their mind structure, whatever it was. Anyway, last person I told was my sister. So my sister is three and a half years older, but really from another generation. That's, all, that's sort of been clear. She, she, her concern, she said, well, you've had every advantage. You've been able to do whatever you want, and your child should have the same. And I said, well, why wouldn't it? And she said, well... What if it wants to be president of the United States? Anyway, so there was no support there. Bottom line, no support from the family. Meanwhile, what I didn't say is my partner had come to me before all this, and had he had talked to one of his sisters who had said to him, you're too young, you can't do this. And he came to me and said, you're on your own. I can't, you know, I'm too young. And I, I knew I was on my own. And I knew that, you know, his excitement about it was not, very grounded. So in a way that didn't bother me. But I was really on my own. There was no Do you remember were you looking for support and approval? I was looking for support, not necessarily approval. We'll be there for you. Okay. We wish different, you know, but I just didn't know. I felt completely alone. Right. 
And my friends were saying, oh, no, you know, I was in a spiritual school. Oh, the school will be there for you and so forth. I, I didn't trust that. Anyway, I was going crazy because, as I say, everybody had an opinion. And I wanted to make the decision from the place. I knew there was another place to make it from. Long story short, my spiritual teacher, I had a conversation with him. And he said, you know, what's going on? I told him, he said, look, a child should be brought in with joy and love. If there's contradiction, it's not the time. See if you can resolve the contradiction. I was so relieved because then I knew how to go about it. And I remember going for a walk and just going, oh, okay. I just look at, you know, anyway, I got to the point where I realized I couldn't, I couldn't get out of contradiction. Did you feel joy at being pregnant? I think the fear just choked it. What did you imagine might have happened had you gone it alone? It wasn't the, the stigma part. It was just, I was just afraid I couldn't handle it, that I'd fuck it up somehow. Okay, so it was, it was mainly about not being a good enough parent. Yeah. You know, I, at one point I went to my doctor and I said, okay, I can't do this. And he said, are you sure? And I said, no. And he said, I want you to be sure. So, you know, there was a three-month time limit. I waited until really pretty much the last day of the three months. And I had the abortion on my birthday, so I would never forget. Oh, wow. And what did you not want to forget? Well, it hadn't been an accident. And there was no way I could tell myself that I wasn't ending the life of a being. And it was horrifying to me. I'm sure, yeah. And I was a mess. I was a complete mess while it was happening. And it's interesting because I remember, you know, they put me under to have the abortion and, you know, I was sobbing and, and my doctor who I had, you know, I had a good relationship with him. And he said, what are you crying about? I'm the one who has to do this. And, you know, so it was just, yeah, it was raw. It sounds like there's a huge amount of insensitivity for you around this. Yeah. And my partner went with me. I mean, he he hung in there and we actually were together for a long time afterwards. And part of what I've been told to do by my spiritual teacher was that if I had the abortion, I was to do a ceremony where I contacted the essence of the child and said, it's not the time, but I vowed to bring it back at another time. And I did that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that was that. And I remember <laughs> asking him a few years later, because there was still contradiction, you know, we talked about it a lot. Every, and I said, does that mean this lifetime? You know, I made that vow. Does that mean this lifetime? And he laughed and said, yes. Okay. Anyway, that relationship ended. And, you know, eight or nine years later, I was in a new relationship with somebody who already had children and didn't want any more. I knew that had been one of the issues with him and his previous girlfriends who wanted children and and I just, you know, I was like, okay, well, that's easier. At least he's not going to be pushing me to have a child. So you in your early 40s at this point, is that right? If I've got the math right? I'm in my early 40s. Yeah. And I've still had this vow that I had made. And I don't make vows easily. I think it was the only one. No, I'd made one other vow. But I, and I thought, Eesh, God, you know, I'm going to die having not fulfilled this vow. But that's better than bringing in a child in contradiction. So I'm, you know, damned if I do, damned if I don't. But I'd accepted that. Okay, I'd, that, that's going to be how it is. And with my new partner, I had told him about what had happened. And I said, all I can tell you is I can never have another abortion. I can't, I, I will not be able to do that if the situation arises. And three or four months into our relationship, bingo, I'm pregnant. And I hadn't been doing anything different birth control-wise than I had been doing for the previous nine or ten years. But I'm pregnant again. And actually, I remember saying to him, we better be careful. There's a baby around. I'd never said that before. Was there any conscious or unconscious drive for it to happen to fulfill that vow? Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. I think I had resolved that I'll take the responsibility for an unfilled vow rather than fuck up somebody else's life, you know? Yeah. So, you know, there I am pregnant and we're, so he asks me to marry him. And I said, yes. And it's the only time I ever said yes to anybody. And it was, the, you know, 
I had been asked numerous times anyway, put it that way. And a few days later, we had our first fight. And it was at a level that I had never experienced before. And I was terrified. And the next morning, I said to him, you know, I went and slept in another room. And the next morning, I said to him, these are two separate issues. Let's not conflate them. I don't want to get married. Then here I am pregnant. And we'll just see what happens. I, that's where I was with it. I went to my a new doctor and I said, I, I can't have an abortion. And he opened his door and he took out a stack of index cards. And he said, here are all the people waiting to adopt. And I went, oh, there's an alternative here that hadn't occurred to me. Wow. And so I just thought, okay, I've got nine months to figure this out. We'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. And so one morning, sort of, I was getting close to three months. My partner went out and he gave me a book to read, a science fiction book. It was a rainy day. I'll never forget it. And I started reading the book and I didn't understand why he had given it to me. And then on the page was the line, and I can still see it in italics. It said, they are happiest who have forgiven most. And I put the book down. It just stopped me in my tracks. And I realized I had never forgiven myself and I had never forgiven the partner with whom I had gotten pregnant the first time. And I sat there and I just spent two hours thinking about who we had been, what the culture had been, what the situation was. And I got to a place where I was like, we did the best we could. Yes, we were flawed, but we did the best we could. And I forgave us. Mm -hmm. And I started to miscarry. Wow. Yeah. And so it was like, okay, whoever that was came in again. The vow has been, you know, it's just... That's what happened. I'm not exaggerating. That is exactly what happened. Can I just come in and just, just ask something? Because it's for me, it's been very enlightening and interesting in trying to find people to talk about this. And I have many friends who've had abortions. And what I've heard from so many people is, I don't want to talk about this. And we don't even talk about it. There's this, what seems like a code of silence amongst women. And, and I, I'm, I don't know, I'm not an expert on this, but it does make me wonder how much maybe lack of forgiveness or negative feelings must, well, I say must, but possibly come with this difficult, difficult choice. Would you say from your experience of, of knowing other women? Yeah, because, you know, it, with my clients, this has come up frequently. And I always ask them if they've forgiven them. I mean, I can see, you know, the hesitation to say it, or just something where it isn't just a toss off, oh, yeah, well, I had an abortion. And I'll say, have you forgiven yourself? And it just opens up a flood of stuff. So, yeah, I do think so. I felt like I was sort of, you know, most people aren't having them because they just didn't know if they wanted to get pregnant, so they thought they'd give it a shot to find out. Most people, it's been a mistake. That's why I felt doubly guilty, because I thought, how bloody irresponsible to do that. But this does bring up a very interesting question about when you have you have this right to choose, which is very very important for a lot of us, that, that we, we respect a woman's choice to look after her own body and what happens to it. Right. The, the, there is a real there is a contradiction there in some ways, isn't, isn't it seems. Because you have you have that right to choose and you're told that you have the right to choose. And yet the implications that you might feel from that don't seem to be as clearly put there. No, and and when I did it, you know, I have to understand it, it was the ability to have an abortion was newly available. It was this phenomena, oh, you can have an abortion. You don't have to go to Puerto Rico or wherever, you know, you thought you had to go to get it, Mexico. You just go down the street from where you live and you can have it. I was talking with one of my oldest friends the other night who's been married for over 50 years and has three children and so forth. And I was telling him this, he knew my mother and, you know, and uh, he told me about that he and his wife had had, they had had an abortion. And that was a whole nother story. It's not, not relevant. But what was interesting to me was that he said to me, do you regret that you didn't have the child? And I so quickly said, no. Afterwards, when I left, I thought, that's not true. There are days. Yes, absolutely. 
there's still, it's still this gray area. And in terms of the right to choose, where I came away, everybody has a right to choose, but it's not an option for birth control in my book. Yeah. But I do know people who have had them. And obviously, the person who told me, well, oh, you can have them, are completely, they're just very relieved. Isn't this one, you know, poof, gone. Mm. And when you say it's not a reason for or a way of, of, of having birth control, can you just clarify what that difference is for you? Because there are these kind of moral implications or personal responsibility implications. But can you say in a nutshell what that is? I think there is something to that you're ending a life. And you can ignore it or be in denial about it. I can't. I can't be in denial about it. But it is a personal choice that people should have. And certainly shouldn't be a, you know, a law or a bunch of men deciding it. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just... No, absolutely. When you say th that question you had about regret, how often do you think about it or imagine had you had not terminated those, well, that one pregnancy? Not infrequently, <laughs> you know, and I have had, I mean, as my friend said to me the other night, well, you've had, you know, you've had the ability to have an incredibly independent life. And that's true, and I've enjoyed it, and I've certainly taken full advantage of it. And there's a part of me that said, yes, and it's allowed you to be incredibly selfish, which you wouldn't have been able to do. And, you know, I'm surrounded by people who have children, there are times I just go, I don't have that family around me. But I also see that it isn't necessarily wonderful. So it's just, I don't know. It's just never been cut and dry. I have other friends who are very clear from the get-go, no, I do not want children. What strikes me about your story so far is that one of the reasons that you didn't want to go ahead was because you felt that your parents had failed in some way. Is that fair to say? And yet your enlightened perspective, to even think that way, suggests that you were more evolved on many levels. Did that ever occur to you that even by questioning it, you're in a very different place than your parents? Well, it's an assumption I'm making. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, your upbringing, I mean, it's just very hard to completely shake the messages that I got from them. So, no, it is clear to me that, yeah, but it just feels like, you know, two different universes and um, lonely. I still feel that way with the remaining members of my family because now, of course, my parents are gone and my sister's gone. Lonely in what, what way in particular? Well, I just see people around me. You know, family is everything. Family is, and my mother tried to instill that. You know, your friends will desert you. You know, blood runs sicker than water and so forth. It just, I don't feel that I have that heart-to-heart, soul-to-soul, whatever it is, connection with my family. And do you imagine that you might have had that had you had children or a child? Well, I have a couple of friends who have really good relationships with their daughter. I mean, my primary difficulty was with my mother. And so part of me just thinks, well, that's just mothers and daughters. That's just what happens. But then I have a couple of friends who have really good relationships with their daughters. I think how wonderful to have that best friend thing, which my mother kept saying that my sister and I were her best friends. And I was like, geez, that's kind of pathetic because we're worlds apart. I guess in the absence of becoming a parent, it's always going to be fantasy to some extent, isn't it? Absolutely. It might have been terrible. It might have been wonderful. And some of the interviews I've done you know, with people, it's not all roses. Definitely not. And there are plenty of times, I mean, <laughs> I was I was at an event last weekend, and there were all sorts of people there, and there was this, you know, maybe five-year-old in front of me, and he was throwing a some kind of fit. I mean, and I, I my first thought was, oh, thank God I didn't have them. Now, if you don't mind me saying, just for the sake of the listeners, that the, you, you are now in your 80s. Yes. Because I think that is, I think this is such a... a a fascinating and useful perspective for people because we, we tend or what well, from what i've seen is it always tends to be about young people who are having abortions well and seeing how much the culture has changed i mean you know listening to your other people you know having a donor being a single parent all fine you know 
And I remember my mother, I had a very good friend who used to bring her children up to my mother's place. You know, we'd all be around the pool together. And she had never gotten married. And my mother would look at the children and say, oh, they're so wonderful. It's such a shame. They're bastards. I mean, yeah. and the other thing that I didn't say, which was interesting, when I got pregnant the second time, as I say, it was like, you know, nine years later or something like that. And I told my sister and she was like, oh, have it. People are doing it all the time. So she had gone through this transformation. I did feel I would have had her support. Yeah. But nine years, you know, she read read enough articles about people having babies without getting married that it was now not such a stigma or as, at all a stigma. Celebrities were doing it. It was sort of the thing to do. <laughs> Before we started talking with this recording, you, you mentioned that you'd thought a lot about this subject, obviously, since I'd asked if you'd come and talk about it. Was there any... Any change in your thinking around it, having consciously thought about it, preparing for today? Well, you know, I had always, I had frequently told the story of my mother's reaction, but I had told it as a joke. And when I told it last week to a, dear, a close friend, you know, she was just, she wasn't horrified, but, but her reaction of like, you know, your mother never ceases to amaze me, you know, was to really understand how, I don't even know what the word is. <laughs> what a terrible thing for a mother to say to us. <laughs> you know, if you want a child, have an abortion and adopt one. That way there'll be no stigma. I mean, it's all about what other people will think, not what it will do to you. But she had had one, so she didn't think, you know, she believed the justification that, you know, it was too soon between my sister and me for her to carry another child, and so it was fine. She didn't get into what I got into. So for some for for someone listening now, for example, if they're in in the situation where they're they're pregnant and they're they're questioning whether they want to go ahead or not, how important do you think getting or rallying for support for what what will what will happen this this massive change in someone's life? Do you think that had had your parents said this is wonderful, we will support you, you would have gone ahead? Yeah. Okay. I think this is a really important point because from what I've got the sense from people is that they feel very lonely with the decision to end the pregnancy. And maybe that is because they just don't feel they're able to do it personally and there isn't the infrastructure or the money or God knows what. But it, it sounds like that maybe if there was more open conversation about this and less stigma, because it seems there is still stigma. You think there's still stigma? That's interesting. Well, only because the this is the only subject that I've come across so far where there is suddenly a silence and a reticence to talk about it, which surprised me because, and again, I'm, I have to really keep qualifying the fact that I'm not a woman, I can't imagine this, but it's, it, it is something I've noticed that there is this moment where, oh, this subject, even though people are quite willing to say, oh, yes, I've had two abortions. That seems to come out quite quickly, but then it's, we're not going to go any further on that. Now, that's just anecdotal evidence from the conversations I've had the last couple of weeks. Interesting, yeah. So it's a question for me. But I guess anything in life, support is important. Yeah, I think, I mean, I just felt like, you know, this child was going to be raised around people who were constantly disapproving. I mean, that was just a repeat of what I went through. Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you so much for sharing that with me. I mean, I, I agree with, with what you're saying. It's not a joke, the story. I mean, it's it's very sad to hear that. And it's really made me think about times that I've really wanted other people to help me make a step in a certain direction, and they haven't stepped up. Not because of their fault, but that I think that sometimes it's hard to admit that we do need that that very special support in those moments. Yeah, you know, and I mean, their friends were supportive, but I knew on some level that friends can come and go. But, you know, whether I'm getting along with my family or not, they're still my family. Yeah. No, you need you need your team that you can rely on as much as you can. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Great pleasure to speak to you. And thank you for being so open about something that I know is deeply personal and very, very touching. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely been something that I've thought a lot about and helped other people with too, I hope, I think. Oh, for sure, for sure. Thank you. 
Thanks, Jared. My final guest is called Susie. And Susie worked for many years for Amnesty International as head of press. And so she always had a very keen interest in human rights and particularly um, how women are treated in society. She currently works as a kinesiologist and a healthcare practitioner. Good afternoon, Susie. Afternoon, Jared. Thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. So this afternoon, we're going to talk about what I have discovered is a very sensitive issue for some people, not for everyone, of course. But I have been surprised by how sensitive an issue this is and, and the reaction I've had from people. So I'm very grateful to have a chance to speak to a woman who is um, obviously a woman, but also very interested in, in women's human rights and general welfare of women. Is that fair to say? Good characterization of where you stand? Yep, absolutely. Been a feminist from the moment I knew what the word meant. Okay, great. Do, do, do you actually just do, do you want to define that? How, 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 you, how you define being a feminist? Well, given that we, we live in a patriarchy, I think it's important. I've always found it important to understand that we have to, as women, be very vocal about our rights and our equality in a society that still um, puts men at the top of the pile. So, and in this country, we might not necessarily see it so overtly. There are many people that might think, what are women complaining about? You know, like, my boss is a woman. <laughs> yeah. But of course, around the world, it's a different story in so many countries. So, Yeah. And obviously, that ties in very closely with the work when you work with um, Amnesty International. What was it that, that drew you to working for that organization? I have been a seeker of justice all my life, completely compelled to try and rescue everyone in the world. So by the time I could advocate on people's behalf, I was in university, I was standing on the trestle tables, waving, you know, with these leaflets and shouting at people to come and join the anti-racist committee and even though the anti-racist committee at that time was full of white people, it didn't matter because mm. we were so, so vociferous in our call for equality. And, and I've always been like that. So by the time I reached age 23, where I first worked at Amnesty, and I started there as a freelance journalist, and it just seemed like an amazing organization at that time. This was in the early 1990s, and I was really driven to Amnesty's doors throughout through my own experience of terrible injustice. As many people many people are who end up working for these organizations, they have they experience in their life a sense of injustice. And either to themselves or to those they love or it's always through our experience really that we're driven to work for others or was it one particular injustice that was the straw that broke the camel's back or was it a defining moment for you? Yes. So my childhood was not easy, but it was an experience in South America that led me to Amnesty's door because I was basically thrown into prison on a false charge and I spent six months in a South American prison and I was lucky to get out in six months. And I was charged. <laughs> I was, I, the prosecution was looking for 10 years. So I was set up with a bit of weed, which wasn't mine. And it was, in fact, so tiny that you couldn't even build a joint with it anyway. However, under the laws of that country in South America at the time, and across South America and the whole hemisphere, actually, the, they were really minimum of 10 years for drug trafficking. So they were just trying to get you on a drug trafficking charge because it was the war against drugs, which was run really primarily by America. And America would give these countries great incentives, financial and otherwise, to imprison and charge as many people as possible. Was that directed at women at the time or was it anyone? 
Well, that's a really good question because I was traveling on my own as a as a backpacker. I was definitely a sitting duck and I was staying in a in a hostel on my own in my own little room and I had been staying there for a couple of months and I had a job in a bar so I was known to everyone who worked in the hotel. I had a lovely time. It was a lovely little place and but it was a very very well known hotel and subsequently I found out that the owner of the hotel was the um, chief of police's son. <laughs> so they would regularly wow. do drug, drug raids. And I was just sitting dark. I was on my own. So yes, as a lone woman traveling, yeah, we are more vulnerable. But at that time, I was belligerently, I can do whatever a man can do. And I still obviously believe that to a great extent. However, the truth is that women are more vulnerable when they travel on their own and in the world at large, because women are still seen as prey. Yeah. The, this idea of you know, women being alone is, for me, what came up in these interviews, is I was very acutely aware of how lonely the story sounded. And in spite of looking for help, looking for support, it just didn't seem to be there. I know you've listened to the two interviews. What stood out for you in them? Well. It's always lovely to hear women to really speak their truth and to really verbalize and vocalize these stories that generally probably remained hidden all their lives. Because I also had an abortion when I was in my 20s as well. And I'd never spoken about it to anyone, never told anybody, apart from my partner, who is still with me, the same partner. And we subsequently went on to have a couple of children, as you know, Jared. But that was a decision right early on in our relationship. But yes, of course, it just struck me that I have never talked about this with anyone. So I, you know, I think it's, it's great that you're doing this and asking these questions. Why do you think that is? Why are women? I mean, I say women because my, my assumption is that women, unlike men, get together and talk about everything. So this has been the big surprise for me. Why have you never spoken to anyone outside of your partnership? Shame. <laughs> it's the shame, Jared. It's the because of course there's still stigma attached. Ultimately, society cares more about the unborn child than it does about women. It just does, always has done. Women's health and well being is really at the bottom of the pile in this issue, as well as in others. But um, you know, of course it's a really obviously a very personal subject, but then again, it feels easier to talk about, you know, being abused as a child, for example, or having miscarriages than it is to say I had an abortion. And that still stands to this day, which is astonishing. Is that because you are seen as the perpetrator in a sense, if, if it's kind of seen like a guilt crime thing, that somehow you are the one that's doing it? Yeah, the unborn child is the victim. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the fact that even progressive and outspoken feminists feel the pressure to keep quiet about their own determinations means that many, means many things. But one of the things it means is that the, that the opponents of abortion get to define it however it suits them. And this is another reason why it's really important that we start talking really and sharing but there are lots of things that women don't really talk about, Jared. You know, we don't talk about our periods, really. We don't talk about our menstrual pain and agony from the age of 13. It's, you know, for example. Not even or, and with each only other. now. No. And only now we're starting to talk about menopause, really, as a, in the public domain, yeah. which is fantastic. Yeah, so the next subject I'm hoping will be menstruation. <laughs> Just going back to what you're saying about, you know, the, the attention is on the unborn child. I mean, if that's the case, it sounds like it really is damned if you do and damned if you don't, meaning you cannot win because there is a the argument that if you bring a child into the world and you're alone and you can't care for it and many reasons why people choose to have an abortion, I'm assuming. And then equally, if you do do it, then have you taken a life? I mean, it just it just sounds like an absolute minefield of rights and wrongs that is, is completely subjective and can change. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, 
the fact that, the, you know, what, what struck me from, was it Millie, her conversation yeah. with you? I think she said that there's just so little time to think about it. And that really struck me as a really important factor that I hadn't considered before. That, of course, the clock's ticking when you find out you're pregnant. And sometimes you don't find out for a few weeks. And then the clock really is ticking if you want to consider terminating. And it's it's such a complex issue as well. And it's generally you are completely unsupported as well because, I mean, I guess it matters how your relationships are outside of maybe your partner at the time. And, you know, if, for example, you have a really great supportive network around you, great great relationship with your mother, very close, very open and with your sisters or, or, or whatever, you might, I mean, I guess I'm talking about myself here. Okay. If I had had a really supportive well female called. network <laughs> around me at that time in my 20s when I was really racking my brains and my heart about whether to go through with a with a termination or not, or with a pregnancy. If I'd had that support saying, it's okay, we're here for you, I might well have chosen differently. I only just really thought about that after listening to Millie's conversation with you. I thought, yes, it's, it, it's, a lot of it is about support. It goes back to what you said earlier about the feeling of loneliness and being alone. You are totally alone when you make these decisions, really, whether your partner is with you or not. I mean, of course, it makes it easier if your partner's going to support you, whatever. But it's your body, and you're the one that's going to have to really go through with it or not, either way. But it's, yeah, the support is you. Just going back to Amnesty's role, which is about human rights, protecting human rights and promoting human rights, for me, one of the most important aspects of that in the work that I do is people's mental health, spiritual health, how they navigate their own life. And I'm, I was curious when I was looking at these statistics with Amnesty about how many abortions there are, that 25% globally of all pregnancies end in abortion, a lot of them in very, very dangerous situations for the mother, the potential mother. From what you remember, did Amnesty look into mental health as a human right in relation to abortion? Was that ever considered or ever talked about? No. And you, you could argue that, I mean, I think it's a valid question, Jared. It's really interesting. But you could argue that, that there was so much work to be done on even women having the right to choose that it was just such a major issue. And it still is. I mean, the fact that you know, Roe versus Wade in America has been overturned by the Supreme Court and there are states that now ban abortion in America, which is just astonishing. And barbaric in practice when you think about the fact that there are girls who've been who could be raped or suffer from incest and they're not allowed abortions t- today in America in certain states. It's just so astonishing and so barbaric that if you think about it, it's such a huge issue just to keep women's rights on the table, physical rights, physical integrity, the right of the, of choosing what to do with your own body. That, yeah, I can understand that mental health has taken a back step. You know, maybe that will come one day. But we're still dealing with a symptom here, aren't we? Because as, as you've said, I know this is hypothetical, but as you've said, you might have had that child, and also my two other guests alluded to the same thing, which suggests that we as a society, if we were more healthily functioning as a society, that we could share the responsibility for each other and care for each other so that any child can come into the world. That it sounds to me, that, or it seems to me like that's really the problem, or well, the cause is not actually abortion is the issue. It's how we actually care for each other and yeah, as I say, support. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Because that's what struck me most from your conversations from Zara, I think, and Millie. I found that it's really for me personally as well, it's like, oh wow, it was it really was the lack of support that led me down that road at that time 
because as I say, it was early in my relationship with my partner. So I just felt I was on my own. But yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. I don't feel that we as a society, I mean, it's the way that we are supposed to have family life, you know, with the partners and then they bring up their children and then we live in our own little isolated houses and and not in a community, you know, we're not surrounded by family or generally we're and um we're all on out here on our own. And even as a young mother as well, you think when you've got babies and you, you feel very isolated as well. And I would imagine that most mothers would say that. I've called this a code of silence, and I hope that's not offensive to anyone, but that was kind of the phrase that kept coming up in my head as I was talking to people, not not just the people I interviewed, but generally when I was asking people about how much discussion there is. And I, and I really am exploring this in a very naive male way. Do you think it's true that there is a kind of code, an accepted non-verbal aspect to this this issue? Yeah, I mean, I think there's an accepted silence. It's like, yeah, it's, a, it's an acceptance that this is a subject not to be aired in public, that it's too sordid, it's too upsetting, it's too controversial. And that's that, that does still stand. I mean, I know that all of our stories, our abortion stories are so generally complex and they're not black and white, they're multifarious and kind of kaleidoscopic in nature, aren't they? Well, there's so many factors that lead women and girls to to go down that path. And it's never an easy path. I mean, I guess occasionally it might be, wow, I can't wait to get rid of this, you know, because <laughs> I'm too young or I'm too on my own or whatever. But it's generally a difficult decision, really difficult and and challenging. And I think for women, because of its challenging nature, and because even if you do decide on, on, on an abortion, there's not, I mean, I know there are women who would be delighted to have an abortion because thank God that for whatever reasons, but there's a lot of us who, you know, who do carry some sort of questions and doubts and, you know, about our decision and was it right? And, and therefore, are you going to want to talk about it really? So I think there is an an acceptance that it's something you just don't talk about. One side of this, which I feel I need to bring up because uh, there are men listening to this as well, is the male side of it. And I know that that's a difficult one because we do not have to go through the ultimate choice. But for me personally, I had a partner in my 20s and I was very insistent on a termination happening within the relationship because it didn't feel right to me. Now, as a kind of a selfish, young, 20-something-year-old, you know, having fun, for me, it was, it, at the time, it seemed like no big deal. And if I think back now, I didn't really know anything. I didn't even understand it. I just knew that abortion was a thing that's available. And so that was my kind of knee-jerk response, like, okay, let's get rid of it. So I think what I'm coming to here is there's a, a real lack of education for men and women around this. Because if what we're saying is that women are not getting support, they need to be supported by intelligent men as well as women. And I think it has to be, well, I'm drawing conclusions here, I don't know. But there surely has to be a wider conversation around this so that even young people can make informed choices. Yeah, I mean, I think I, think I, I do feel that somehow all of the issues that are deemed to be women's issues and interestingly, even though women would like abortion to stay as a women's issue in many ways because it's our bodies, yeah, you know, we're there are so many issues that really just affect women's bodies that they don't get the attention. They don't get the attention scientifically or in society or culturally that they should do. And then and again, you're thinking, wait a minute, isn't this half the population? I mean, it's just completely mind-boggling to me. <laughs> Although I understand it because we live in a patriarchy. And I have to say, Jared, it gives me great joy to even be able to say those words because we live in a patriarchy. Because yeah. for my pretty much my whole life until the Me Too movement, 
it was not acceptable as a woman to say we live in a patriarchy, not publicly, not outside your women friends, because you you'll just be tarred as a as a hairy old men hating mm. feminist. And that has changed. <laughs> thank, the, thank God. That, okay, so, good. So that there is change there, yeah. There is change because we can talk about feminism now without sounding like we hate men. And that's new because when I was 18, 19, 20, feminism was was really a dirty word. And many of my female friends would not have said they were feminists because of that. So there, there have been big changes. But, you know, women's rights are not enshrined in stone. You know, that takes us back to Amnesty's focus on women's rights, physical rights, as opposed to mental health rights, because, you know, laws change, as we can see with Roe versus Wade. So, you know, women might think, hurrah, we can, we can do this, we can do that, we, you know, but they change these laws. So we have to keep on our toes. Yeah. And from what I'm hearing from, from people is that there does need to be a more open conversation around this so that people don't feel that it's a shameful, guilt-ridden experience that has to be pushed away. It, just to end, is that this has put you on the spot, but having listened to those two interviews, and thank you for sharing your personal experience as well, is there anything that you think should happen to help women who are thinking of having an abortion now or who have recently? Well, I think it has to start with, as you said, education. So what I would love to see is in schools, in primary school, a proper education of reproduction, of all the issues of sexual reproduction, where they actually sit the boys and the girls together, which is what they don't currently do. Well, they didn't from in my, my children's school anyway, so I don't know if that's the case nationwide, but I would expect that it is still that they're actually both the boys and the girls are sitting together. So the boys are learning, the boys are learning about menstruation, the boys are learning about abortion, the girls are learning about the boys' side of the story, etc. I mean, it just seems like common sense to me that, and at the moment, there's no education that the boys have to learn about girls and women and 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 their and all of the issues around reproduction. And and I just think that that's that would be huge. That would be seismic if that would start with education at school. So that's where it has to start, really. And, you know, fortunately, we are in a generation now where us as women are more open with our children, with our girls, with our sons, where we don't feel so embarrassed to talk about these these issues. My mother never mentioned the word tampon to me when I was 13. She, you know, when I got my period for the first time, she just quietly opened the airing cupboard and then pointed out where the sanitary towels were kept. And that was it. There was no conversation. So that has changed. So that's great. So yeah, you know, more more conversation and more involvement of men and boys. It's funny because you, cause you mentioning that uh, I was speaking to one of my patients this morning about this interview this afternoon, and she used to run um, a primary school and the first one was just little boys. And she said they were on one day of the week, they, they could bring in any toy they wanted with them. And most of the boys would bring in very boyish type toys. And there was one little boy that always used to bring in his Barbie doll. And each week he'd bring a different, bar- well, different outfit for the Barbie doll. And she was saying that she encouraged them all to pay attention to the Barbie doll. And that these little boys then suddenly got very invested in what Barbie was going to be wearing and why she was wearing it. And she said what she saw immediately was that that very sensitive, nurturing, almost glamorous part of these little boys is just there ready to be activated, you know, without fear of turning them all into homosexuals, of course. But it was just very striking, you know, that uh, that's what we do. We still do it. Yeah. Despite all our, our moves forward, we still very much segregate out what, what boys and girls, men and women, supposedly like and need to know. Absolutely. What I'm getting from you know, talking to so many people about this is that it is it is men as well that need to be really educated on this and get in touch with it, what it must be like to have to make that choice to abort a pregnancy. You know, just to pause and really contemplate that. Susie, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been really, really helpful. You're so welcome. I'm glad you're doing this. I hope to have you back again in the future with another subject. It's been great talking to you. 
Wow, well, thanks, Jerry. I'd love to come back. So this has been quite a journey for me to really talk to women about the experience of having abortions. And I must say, I am very surprised by what I call the code of silence, meaning that women don't seem to be readily getting together and supporting each other. Now, obviously, this is not a study. It's not something that I can prove in some way. But I spoke to a lot of women asking if they'd consider being interviewed for the podcast. And although many, many women said, yes, I've had a termination and that's my right to choose. And there's quite a, um, an open conversation about that as a fact. But clearly, from what I've experienced, people don't really want to go there for lots of different reasons. And I think we've heard some of them in these, in these interviews. I hope this has been useful to you. What I like about uh, this series is that we're not trying to come up with any conclusions. We're not trying to find the answers, but rather just have a very open and transparent dialogue around some of these very, very personal and emotive areas. And of course, there is nothing more important than how we choose to move forward in life, meaning that the future of us as a species is dependent on our attitudes around fertility, baby making, and also the right to choose to end a pregnancy when it feels right. I hope you've enjoyed this series and we very much look forward to welcoming you back to The Power of the Choice in the next series, which is all about choices around your health. Thank you for listening to The Power of Choice podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast and found it valuable, please consider subscribing, leaving a rating or a review. Do join me next time on The Power of Choice with me, Jared Kite.